Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining me for a very special uh, Town Book Center virtual event. So I am here tonight with Colby Bloom, and we're going to be doing more artwork, which is exciting for me because I have very little artistic talent, and I love watching someone try and tell me how easy it's going to be because then I start to believe I could really do it myself. So uh, Colby Bloom is the author of Wilderness Watercolor Landscapes and the new book, Stunning Watercolor Seascapes. Uh, and is the creator of the popular watercolor and calligraphy Instagram account, This Writing Desk. She also teaches watercolor workshops and classes on Skillshare. She lives in the DC metro area with her family. Uh, you can get uh, her social media on at This Writing Desk. And uh, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to turn it over. Colby, thank you so much for being here with me tonight. I really appreciate it. Hi, I'm so excited to be here with you, Drew. Thanks yeah. for inviting me. Uh, and for anyone watching at home, yes, you can see that I am actually not in my... Uh, library or my living room like I normally am. I am here at the store, um, which is always exciting. I love getting to do stuff a little different and uh, I got the comfy chair, so I'm ready to roll. Colby, what are we, uh, what, talk to me a little bit, because I've got a copy of your book right here. Talk to me a little bit about stunning watercolor seascapes. Why seascapes? What, what inspired you to do the ocean? Well, honestly, um, a big part of the reason why I decided to write this book is because Painting the ocean uh, has always terrified me. Um, I am, uh, I'm self-taught, so I didn't go to art school. I didn't, you know, I haven't been painting since I was four. I, I picked up watercolor in my mid twenties, and um, and landscapes uh, kind of came more naturally to me, which is, you know, why the landscapes book came first and. I always kind of froze up when I thought about learning how to paint water better. In the landscapes book, I have a couple, I have some water scenes, um, but even when I was writing that, it felt, you know, it, it just wasn't my forte. And so I decided that I wanted to try to learn it better. And after I did, I thought, well, if I, a self-taught artist, I'm having trouble learning how to paint water, then probably lots of other self-taught artists are having trouble learning how to paint water. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so after I practiced for, I just, I painted so many really, really terrible seascapes. Mm -hmm. um, I finally <laughs> came up with some some systems and techniques that worked for me to, to paint more, you know, beautiful seascapes. So yeah. when I pitched it to my editor, they said, let's go for it, so. Yeah. So what are some of the unique challenges that painting water and the ocean present? Um, because, for example, I can acknowledge, like me with my zero artistic talent, I'm like, yeah, painting water seems tricky. Couldn't tell you why, but it does seem hard. Yeah, painting water is difficult because there are so, I mean, mainly because of all the light, right? Water is technically see-through, it's transparent, but you can see it because of all of the light and the minerals and the rocks and like whatever all other stuff is happening inside of it. And if you want to paint realistic-ish, I mean, that's kind of where I fall. I feel like I'm more of like a loose, realistic-ish kind of watercolor painter. But if you want it to look like water, you have to have lots of different elements going on. And so when I first tried to capture that kind of complexity of moving water, it didn't look anything like it. It looked just like a big giant mess. And um, so that's that was kind of the barrier that you get when you try painting with watercolor, especially if you want the like subtle blends of colors you need to paint with wet paper. But then if you paint with wet paper, you don't get the, um, you know, the, like the really defined waves or crashing all the other ripples and textures going on. And so that was kind of where I got stuck initially is how do I get this really soft glowing light that you see in water, but also the defined ripples that make it actually look like water as opposed to just, you know, blends of color on the paper. Sure, sure. Um, and, and you mentioned something that's interesting, you know, the idea that watercolor is a little more you know takes a little more artistic license at times with shapes and colors and how things you know look do you find that that made it easier in some ways because you're not you know you're you know you're like hey it's not going to look like you know 
it's it's going to look like a watercolor painting. It's going to be a little more free. It's going to be a little more open. Or did that mm-hmm. kind of do the opposite? And you're like, well, because I know it's going to be more free, because I know it's going to be more open, I got to really double down on these lines. I got to make sure that everything's so crisp. Because you know, I for the people at home, and I apologize, I'm going to hold this up, and you'll see. Like looking at these, these do not look like watercolors. These <laughs> look like I. That looks like an oil painting. What's going on there? So which did it did it pull you in either direction or just kind of didn't this you're like this is my chosen you know milieu it's fine <laughs> well so I'm going to answer your question by saying one of the reasons that I was drawn to watercolor initially mm-hmm. is because before I started painting in my mid twenties I felt like a proud hardcore perfectionist. Mm-hmm somebody who wanted to learn how to do something right or else I wasn't going to do it at all, which is a hallmark of perfectionism, right? That whole like all or nothing. I'm either all in or I'm all out. Um, And watercolor, you can't, I mean, you can be that way with watercolor, I guess, but I think that watercolor is a lot more powerful and a lot more evocative when it, when you let go of a lot of that control. And um, so just kind of segueing that into, it's a push and pull with me. It's less of like, okay, I'm gonna go into painting seascapes knowing exactly where I wanna put these lines and to try to control the beast that is watercolor. It's less of that and more of, okay, I know that watercolor wants to do what it wants. That's kind of, like you said, the hallmark of watercolor is that it, it's, it can be really loose and difficult to control. Um, so I'm I'm not going to try to control it. I'm more going to try to practice being uncomfortable and uh, you know kind of dive into this mess. And then once I've made a big mess, look around and say, okay, how can I guide this into looking something like moving water? Does that make sense? It does, so yeah. it's yeah. So it's a lot of like, okay, well, I'm just gonna put a bunch of color on here and see what happens and then take stock of that and make choices along the way, either to maybe be more intentional or to be more more loose about it. And I think that it's um, a practice that is was very difficult for me to jump into. But once I did, um, I don't know, it's, it's basic. For me, painting with watercolor, especially painting seascapes with watercolor, allows me to both have a vision and try to see it through, but also be open to surprises and be open to like, you know, the sense of wonder that comes when you just stumble upon something really cool. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my philosophy when it comes to that. (laughs) No, it's a great philosophy and also a great sort of catch up for anyone who didn't see us the last time we hung out sort of talking about like your journey through, you know, becoming an artist and what that meant and how you've gotten there. Um, Mm -hmm. so for the folks watching home, I only have a couple more questions and then you'll actually get to see the thing you're really here for, which is watching Colby paint, not listening to me ask bad questions. Um, So my my next question is, you know, with with working with with water, you know, water, when I think about it, you know, out in the world, water absorbs so much of sort of the characteristics of what's going on around it. You know, the water in a cold pond on an autumn day in New Hampshire is very different from the water on, you know, in a beach down in Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, So what were some challenges in trying to capture the different states of, they're not really states of water because we're not talking about ice, I suppose, but different, you know, environments that you find water in. You know, again, just sort of looking at, looking at the back here, you've got a very beautiful tropical, you know, sort of vibe right here with very pink water, pink skies. And then over here, you've got, you know, like a creek somewhere in the woods, which has got, it's just, it's a very clear, pure kind of feeling. What were some of those challenges uh, for you? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I very intentionally included multiple bodies of water in the book because I, I think that, I mean, it would be fun to paint just a whole bunch of beaches, which I think is typically what people think of when they think seascapes. But um, I, I really want to stretch my students. I want them to you know, try out lots of different things, especially as a beginner, so that they can know that 
even if something is difficult for you, that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I very intentionally did that. And I think the challenges that came with that were, um, I mean, like you said, just trying to figure out exactly how water looks and how water feels in different spaces. And the, the way that I kind of approached that was actually more to do with the color palette. Um, like if I was painting a more tropical, like jungle or, you know, Caribbean beach kind of scenes, the water would have green in it. Um, cause I found that like, I don't know. And, and most of the reference photos that I was looking at, a lot of really tropical scenes just kind of feel lush and they feel, and the water reflects a lot of that. It's a little bit more, um, turquoise ish as opposed to blue leaning um and you know as opposed to maybe more northern seas like there's a, a a project in there called village by the sea which i you know i imagined a little scandinavian hamlet or something um and the, then the water is more it's a little darker uh and so i tried to really capture the emotion and the feeling of a certain place with the color palette um and i wanted for everybody who might, you know, purchase the book or use it, I include the color palette in all of the projects. So, um, and even if you don't have the exact paints that I'm using, you can see the different colors that they are. And so you can try to, to, you know, mix those colors themselves. And, um, anyway, so that, that was kind of my approach with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my, my last question before I, I turn it over to you fully, um, was there a project that you really, fell in love with while you were working on it. You were like, oh, I wasn't expecting you to like this, but man, this was so much fun to do. Oh, yes, there were many of them. <laughs> um, actually, I, I, uh, the whole time I was designing and painting these projects, which was about a year ago, it was about a year ago that I, that I wrapped up the manuscript and mm -hmm. sent it over to my editor. Um, almost every single one, I ended it going, wow, it's the best thing I've ever painted. <laughs> Um, so that was like a really good feeling. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, the the painting on the cover, which is the very last painting in the book, mm -hmm. um, I think it's called Serene Seas, something like that. Um, that one I actually did, I redid three times in order to get it right, which I don't often do actually. I have ADHD, so doing something more than once, <laughs> doing a painting exactly the same or whatever more than once sometimes is my brain doesn't want to, but this one, um, it kind of evolved and, uh, it was a really cool breakthrough painting for me actually, because I tested out, it was one of the first paintings I did for the book, even though it's the last one in the book. Um, and I tested out some techniques I hadn't ever tried before to try to capture, uh, the different colors shining in the water while also capturing some of the wave effects yeah. and, um, anyway, so I loved that one. And then I also loved uh, Pale Stony Creek, which is the creek that's on the back cover. Um, okay. Mostly because that's probably one of the most detailed paintings I've ever painted. I don't usually go into tons of detail like that, but I loved the rock bed. I loved painting the rock bed, be mostly because that whole scene reminded me of, of where I grew up. I grew up in Utah, um, so there's mountains and creeks and trees galore in utah and so that one reminded me of home yeah so those two i think Very cool yeah mm -hmm. no i i love i love that one in the back i have a i have a real weakness for mountains and trees and rivers you know i, I mentioned new hampshire i lived there for a little bit and uh you know there were these lakes you'd find nestled up in the mountains and you were just like oh yeah why would you ever leave this is incredible <laughs> um, yeah all right so i am going to go and make my camera itty bitty small so no one has to see me and make your camera huge and big screen so everyone can watch all the cool Sounds stuff that we're going to do. So I'm going to minimize, boop, and you are all set. So I will ask, I will, I'm here, we will, if people have questions, I can translate them over to you, but you are ready to roll. Okay, perfect. And I am just transferring my camera over to my desk uh, so that you can see yeah. my painting instead of my face we can and see it we are looking good perfect okay so the first thing that i really wanted to show you was um you know i'm glad you asked me about 
painting water and the specific challenges with watercolor because one of the things I wanted to demo is how I, you know, kind of had my breakthrough or whatever in terms of actually putting water scenes together. And my, my initial problem was, so let me just kind of paint for you what I was tr like maybe what I tried to do early on in my water painting um, experiments. Mm -hmm. I knew that I really wanted to paint waves. And so I would try to paint waves that, you know, you know, look like this overlapped, but I also really wanted uh, to have the kind of push and pull of, of colors blending in with each other and so I would try to do all of this like in one layer, right? But the problem is that if you try to do all of these things in one layer, mm -hmm. it just kind of gets messy because, uh, you know, when you try to blend colors, then you lose the definition on the waves. Uh, and I think that there are probably lots of fun ways to experiment if you're trying to create more of an abstract looking ocean. Yeah. Um, but I was trying to not necessarily create photorealistic paintings, but still trying to make them look somewhat realistic. And so uh, my breakthrough happened when I realized that I don't have to paint all of these things at once. When I realized, oh, if I am a little bit more patient with my layering, which is, you know, one of my, patience is not one of my biggest qualities. <laughs> um, but if I'm a little more patient with my layering, then I can build all of this complexity. It's just a little bit at a time. So watercolor is, uh, you know, one of its kind of hallmark characteristics is its transparency, right? You can, uh, you either make it really, really dark by adding not a lot of water to it by having it mostly just be pigment, or you make it really, really light by having it mostly be water. Yeah. And uh so for that reason you know when you're painting with acrylic or oil typically you paint from dark to light right you paint kind of all of the dark subjects first and then you add the highlights last sure. but watercolor is the opposite because watercolor is transparent and so anytime you're trying to bring light into your painting you need to preserve the light of the paper so for that purpose typically we paint from light to dark with watercolor and um, and so when I realized that I can start, I can paint one body of water using lots of different layers. Um, and the more layers that I use and kind of carefully building up the contrast, right? Like starting light and then gradually getting darker uh, and adding a little more detail a little bit at a time, then I can make a body of water look still kind of loose and have that watercolor effect, but also, have um but also have the definition that i wanted of the like with the waves and stuff so i'm going to show you how to do that right now uh and typically you can have lots and lots of layers but i recommend starting at the very least with three so when you're trying to paint you know water that's kind of shimmering with light but also might have some more defined ripples in it you start with a really light wash um, of, you know, whatever color you're going to use. It could be blue, it could be green, it could be a mix of both, but like you're starting with a really, really light wash, uh, meaning mostly just water with a, sl with a little bit of that pigment. And so that's, you know, painting that square that we did here. That I'm painting this square using uh, just, you know, I put a tiny bit of pigment on there and then I mostly just did water to to spread it all out. So you can probably even barely see it right now. Um, and then I let that dry. This is the part that always hangs people up is letting the layers dry a little bit at a time. Sure. Um, and if you have, if you're impatient about letting your layers dry, they have these cool like uh, crafting heat tools that is often, they're often used for embossing or you know, just drying other things, or you can use a hair dryer, I guess. But I often use one of these because I don't always have the patience to wait days on end to wait for these layers to dry. Um, so I like this one. It's like Ranger brand, I think, because it is, um, 
quieter than most of the other ones I've had over the years. Okay. But anyway, so that's I'm not going to do it now because I don't want the noise over this uh, live stream. But um, that's why I painted these this other ones. This might be a really silly question to ask, but you know, with something like that, does it blow hot air? Like, does that does it move the paint? Like, I, I you know, I think of a hair dryer, I think of it blowing things. You know. Yeah, it does. It, it does blow hot air. And actually, this one is hotter than most of the other ones that I've used in the past. Um, but yeah, it does move the paint. And that kind of actually, you know, there there's a really fun technique you can do with one of these that kind of creates a watery effect. Ooh, um, okay. Or hmm, maybe actually I can demonstrate that to you and I'll just kind of mute myself so that people aren't annoyed with the hairdryer sound, but gotcha. they can see. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so I'll explain what I'm going to do. Uh, and then I'll jump back into this thing that I was doing up here. Okay. But basically, because the dryer is going to move the water around, um, you want to, if you want to intentionally have that happen so that you create, you know, it, trying to figure out how to say these words, string them together. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm throwing you off your game. No. Okay, but what about this other thing? No, I love that you asked that because this is a really cool thing. It didn't make it into the book because I already had to cut like five projects from mm, the book. Okay. But, um, but so this is a fun, like exclusive to technique I've not really done very much before. But oh, basically, okay. you put way too much water on your wash. You put tons of water so that when you're drying it, the water moves around. And so then if I put some pigment in here, just randomly, um, as you're drying it, the water moves around and then the paint dries too. Like the paint creates dry paint lines based on where the water is. Okay. And so let me show you how we do that. So I have lots of water and you can tell because it looks like little droplets going everywhere. And maybe I'll just, this is a good time to, so this is like, uh, this color is Prussian blue. And then I'm also adding in Viridian. Okay. That's a combo that I like a lot for like tropical oceans. Sure. Okay. So I'm just going to make sure there's lots of water. All right. And now I'm going to mute and show you what this looks like. All righty. So it's nifty, so like it's it's not really it's starting to go a little bit beyond the edges, but it's like kind of staying in its little square. That's cool. I feel like I feel like I'm commentating. I should be commentating like uh, like I'm watching from the guy on the sports thing. All right, so the water is kind of going around, but it's moving. It it's moving. It looks like water. I mean, it is it is water. I guess that is super cool. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that is really cool. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I dig that. So I think I put a little too much water in it. As you can see, it like went all over. Um, but, you know, these dried paint lines right here, like this is what I'm trying to get. And so as I'm moving the paper around and also moving the dryer around, um, basically it, it like pushes the paint up, but then it dries it. And so it dries in like these cool, like little like patterns that looks like, it, it kind of looks like water. Um, so anyway, that's a, that's like a fun experiment that I've played with in the past before. And it's kind of fun to mess around with. Yeah, but. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, cool. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks. Uh, thanks for asking about that. It's always fun to do something, uh, spontaneous yeah. experiment. Okay. Um, so, but back to this kind of like building complexity with water via layers thing. Um, so we start with this really flat, really light wash and that's what this is, right? Mm -hmm. So then if we're doing three layers, our second layer is, um, just going based off the fact that we're going from light to dark, right? Our second layer is going to be uh, another wet on wet wash, meaning I'm getting the paper wet first, but I'm, I want this to be 
a more what's called luminous wash, meaning I'm going to intentionally um, create pockets of light space with the paint. So basically it's just like the some of the paint is going to be darker in some areas yeah. and some are going to be lighter um, so that some of the paper can come through and it kind of looks like it's glowing. Like you actually see that effect over here, um, but we're going to paint it right now. So the way that you do that is once you have your wet wash, then you grab your paint and you don't want it to be as light as the paint in the previous layer, but you also don't want it to be super dark quite yet. Sure. So in order to, do, to create like a luminous wash, basically I just kind of like put a few dots of paint sporadically throughout. And then I wash off my brush and I just kind of push the paint around with water a bit and uh and the whole point of this layer is we are intentionally leaving behind these little clouds these little pockets of white space so we want like the paper to to interact really gently with the white of i mean the paint to interact really gently with the white of the paper underneath so that we still have you know that kind of glow that's coming up but we also have various colors that are going on. So um, here I can also add some green. This is a layer that's, you know, good to add diff different colors. Um, that's the tropical sunset project that's on the back cover. Yeah. You know, the ocean is pink, but it has lots of different colors in it. And it uses the same three layer process where we start with a flat wash and then we add a luminous texture right here in this second layer um and so then you let that all dry and after you let it all dry this one is a little lighter than this this one is going to be but anyway after you let it all dry that's when you add a dry layer so at this point we have like two layers that have already dried on top of each other right and so now i'm going to take Actually, I'm going to do it with a smaller brush. Mm -hmm. um, now we're going to add the details. And this is uh, this was one of the biggest breakthrough moments for me where I realized, oh, I don't have to choose between wet on wet, which is when you create these like luminous blends, or wet on dry, which is when you get really detailed. Um, you know, you're, you're painting on dry paper, so it's really crisp and detailed lines. Yeah. I can use all of those tools just not at the same time. So we did the wet on wet first, and now we're gonna do the wet on dry on top of the wet on wet. And just kind of create, I always say, in order to create waves, you're kind of doing loose zigzags, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, like wide, wide lines going all the way across the page. And you can mix and match colors if you're trying to get, depending on like the emotion or the geographical area where you are. Um, and so by painting these lines on top of the luminous texture, you know, you're kind of giving, um, that one had a little too much pigment, so I'm adding some water underneath it. Okay, yeah. Who are, you're giving, you know, you're providing yourself lots of areas of interest and you're building contrast. Um, one of the most, that's one of the most important elements of any kind of painting really, but especially landscape and seascape painting is you're trying to build subtle areas of contrast so that your, your scene is interesting so that people think it's fun to look at. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's what contrast does for painting generally. So yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the system yeah. is these loose zigzags on top of the wet on wet washes right on so we've got a question here uh from the audience uh from piper piper would like to know what palette do you use um yes so if you mean this palette uh this is a, a handmade ceramic palette from a uh her name is sarah her business is called sylvan Clayworks. um she has phenomenal palettes i have many of them and i because i'm you know i'm a my desk is pretty much solely dedicated to art, so I like having this big one that just sits on my desk all the time. Mm -hmm. um, 
and but I also have little ones if you need to put them away. I like ceramic palettes because they uh, easily reactivate. So uh, I can easily reactivate all of my paint on top of it and they glide. The paint just glides so smoothly. Sometimes if you use a plastic palette, when you're trying to mix it all together, the paint like beads up instead of kind of run smoothly. And so that's a big reason why I like ceramic palettes. I also like ceramic palettes because I enjoy the feeling of making art using somebody else's art. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. So yeah. A little, little shout out there. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So that was my uh, quick water demo. And let's see, what time is it? Okay. So uh, in the next probably 10 to 15 minutes, I also wanted to uh, really quickly look at one of the projects. We, won't, we don't have time to complete a project the way that it is exactly in the book, okay. but um, just because all of them require lots of different layers. But I did want to show you that watercolor books, with watercolor books or art books generally, you don't always have to... Um, here, this is the this is the project I'm going to have us look at. I'm just going to grab a sheet of paper. So it's called Woodland Fairy Tale. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it has some like ripples on the bottom right here of this lake, and some mountains in the back with some greenery. And then this is supposed to be like Rapunzel's castle or whatever. Um, let me sure we can just do it here. So I think one of at least in my experience, often what precludes people from jumping into watercolor is feeling like you don't have time to sit down for an hour to paint, which is true for a lot of people. I often, you know, I'm, I'm a professional artist and I often can't find time to sit down for an hour to paint. So what do you do when you have lots of fun projects in this book that you just bought, but you're feeling a little intimidated by even though all of my instructions are clearly very well written and very detailed, <laughs> you're still feeling a little intimidated by how many steps there are. Um, so my suggestion to you is to make it more simple. Um, and I'm gonna show you how I would do that um, just by kind of looking at this reference photo and then painting uh, a, a variation of this scene in my this is my watercolor journal. I actually did the same thing with, uh, this is the Pale Stony Creek version. And that and that, photo, that painting initially took me probably like two hours to paint. This painting only took me 30 minutes to paint um, just because I was a lot more loose and not as, you know, I was not worried about making a giant mess. So I'm gonna show you how to paint this one in 10 minutes. And what we're going to do is uh, simplify a lot of things. And, you know, I just barely talked to you about layers. <laughs> and most of this book teaches you how to build complexity by using patient layers. And so I'm, I'm not trying to go against myself here. But if you also want to learn how to, um, you know, paint a little bit more quickly, then this is kind of what we're doing. Okay. So the first, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, whenever I'm trying to paint quickly, I look for the areas that I know are going to need two or more layers because I want to paint those first because I need them to dry, um, you know, by the time I'm finished painting everything else. If I don't have time to wait for them to dry or I feel like I don't have time to use my dryer, then I want to paint the layers that I know are going to need time to dry first so that I can paint everything else by the time I come back to them. Sure. So the the layers that are going to need time to dry, like the most important layer really is the water, right? Because we need the luminous layer that we talked about before, the wet on wet blends, but then we also need the ripples on top of it. And so I'm going to paint the wet on wet blends first. And I am being so loose. I'm not really paying much attention to form. Um, I'm just, you know, I put, I got my water wet and the most important thing with this one, uh, the, with this painting is that it's more blue toward the front of the painting and then slightly more green toward the back because 
uh, in the back is where the foliage is kind of reflecting in the water a little bit. So we're kind of going to paint it a little bit like foresty green right here. It's also a good idea if you're painting really loose like this, it's an excellent way to practice self-compassion, which is something I talk about a lot because it's going to be a giant mess. It is super messy and it's supposed to be. And so that's something I have to remind myself of a lot when I'm painting really loose sketches like this. Like if you paint plain air, um, meaning like you're painting in, in nature, you're looking yeah. at the painting, yeah. um, it, especially with watercolor, it has to be so loose because you don't have time to wait for, to, sure. to wait for layers to dry. So you have to be okay with that. Um, Another kind of trick I do with this kind of one layer thing is intentionally like trying to leave behind little streaks of dry space so that you have some texture in the water there that could act as like foam or, you know, different highlights on it. Mm -hmm. But okay, so we have this lake. I know I want this to dry. So I'm going to start painting everything else next. Yeah. And um, typically when we paint with watercolor, we paint light to dark. But because uh, I'm trying to do this pretty much all in one go, I'm going to start from bottom to top and uh, kind of go from there. So for the trees, I'm, I'm going to practice a technique that's called scumbling, which uh, basically just means I am moving my paintbrush around randomly. And I'm not really paying much attention to where it's going. I just know that I want it to kind of look like trees. And, um, and so I'm kind of like gently moving my hand a little bit back and forth, trying to uh, keep some tiny little pockets of white space in between so it looks like, you know, foliage a little bit. Um, but for the most part, I'm just randomly placing marks. And uh, the more comfortable you can get, I think this is, scumbling is usually hard for beginners because it's awkward. It feels really weird not knowing where you're painting. It feels like this isn't right. If like any artist who does this knows exactly where their hand is going. But I'm telling you as a person who makes art for a living, it's not so much that I know where my hand is going as I've gotten so much more comfortable not knowing where it's going. And just kind of, you know, looking for the, the joy in that. Okay. So I have the foliage going on here. It might not look exactly like trees, but that's okay. Um, I am going to see what time it is. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to decide if I want to. Yeah, I think I'm going to paint it. So <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I am like working on the fly here, um, which is what I do all the time. So I'm going to paint, uh, and because I, the, because this is a loose sketch, right, I'm not going to try to be as detailed with Rapunzel's castle as I was before. Sure. I'm kind of making it super sketchy. And if you want something to look, to intentionally look messy, one of my biggest pieces of advice is to add tons of lines, like to be really messy on purpose because then it looks like, oh, it's not that she didn't know what it was painting. It's, it's more like, oh, they were intentionally making it messy on purpose because that's more emotional and that's more captivating. And of my life right there. Did you do that on purpose? Yeah, yeah, that was definitely, definitely a thing. That wasn't, I'm, yeah, that's, that's my thing. Exactly, absolutely, I did that on purpose. <laughs> Does it look like I did it on purpose? Then yes, I did. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so there is a really rudimentary Rapunzel's castle, but we're, uh, we are going with it. And now I'm going to paint some very light, light mountains in the background. Typically we would paint the mountains first, like I said, but because we're trying to paint this all in one go super fast, I am being really kind of generous with myself and also more exploratory here. So in order to paint these mountains in the back, 
I'm not even going to paint them all the way. I'm going to use white space a lot to my advantage here. Okay. And I'm doing like the outline briefly. And then I'm just kind of doing the scumbling thing again, where I'm kind of filling in some of the spaces, but leaving behind white space so it looks like snow. Okay. And then finally, I'm going to get some very, very, very light blue paint and paint the sky just over the top of it. Okay. So they just barely touch the mountains. And we're almost done. See? So we have like pretty much this whole scene all painted out. Uh, it is way looser than this version, but we also were able to paint it in about. 10 minutes. It looks incredible. A, well, thank you. Yeah, as opposed to spending a little bit more time painting the layers uh, of the other ones. So one last thing that I'm going to do before I get to the water is I talked about building contrast, right? And so one thing, especially if you're painting foliage, is foliage that looks maybe far away, is if you have one layer of kind of lighter green and then another layer of really dark green in front of it, that contrast uh, just kind of adds even more depth to it. And so because this one is closer, like this one is farther away, and so I'm maybe a little bit more okay with just having it all kind of blend in with the water there. Um, but because this kind of, you know, foliage area is a little closer, I added some darker elements so that we can have a little bit more definition. And then finally, uh, I'm going to add um, some Prussian blue here. Uh, a, just a few ripples of water right in the front. Now, it might not have dried all the way, but that's going to be okay. Even if they haven't dried all the way, they might. these ripples might be a little bit blurry, but I'm yeah. not too worried about it. Yeah. If it's blurry, don't worry, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So, we have just a few of these ripples, and again, I'm trying to paint kind of like zigzags, but very wide, like horizontally kind of zigzags. And yeah, there we go. So all finished at by 7.42. Um, Incredible. Anyway, yeah, thank you. Uh, to just kind of like sum up, you don't need to follow. I'm, I'm a person who spends a lot of time making very detailed tutorials so that you know exactly what I'm doing. But you also don't need to follow tutorials if you don't want to. And actually, like doing it this way, where you're kind of using a structure that's given to you, but then experimenting with it and trying to do something new while also having, you know, some kind of guide is a really safe way to practice courage and to grow your own creativity. Because when you experiment like this is when you stumble on you know, your own breakthroughs. That's not so much like, oh, someone taught me this as much as it is. I was just painting and I realized like, oh my gosh, when I paint something this way, it looks like this and I like doing it this way. And anyway, so this is my recommendation if you're kind of looking to grow your own creative style, so to speak, um, while using somebody else's designs. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I dig it. And I think that, you know, you really nailed, nailed it on the head, the idea of, you know, it being about bravery you know I, I think that especially with artistic pursuits there's so much focus on like the end product like oh is it good enough oh well can you make a living off of that oh can you do this and it's so frustrating because you know like I, I, yeah, I played basketball when I was a kid and at no point did anyone come up to me at you know five foot five or whatever I was when I was 12 and go hey man are you like gonna be in the NBA no well, what are you doing nah, this is you know whatever it was just going out there and enjoying it. And I feel like art's treated differently. And it's, I don't, I mean, I, I guess maybe I understand why, but I don't get why it's, and I think that it is about bravery. It's about doing something that's fun and that you enjoy and growing your craft the way you want to do it. And I, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Yep. I, I agree. Art, art is about the process and, uh, uh I'm going to put it back on my face now. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is one of the, the biggest reasons why people who, you know, label themselves as perfectionists have a really hard time, I think, diving into new creative pursuits that they maybe haven't done before because it feels like, oh, well, you know, if I'm not good at it, then what's the point? And the point is how good you feel when yeah. you're doing it. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, a hundred percent. And that's any activity, anything, you know, I, 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 I'm a firm believer in the idea that anything can be art. Uh, that mm -hmm. art is doing something that makes you happy and that you yeah. can show other people the end. I have friends, you know, I have friends who, are, who play video games and they want to show me how quickly they can, you know, beat this one level. There's a, there's art to that. It's, it's all, it's all a big expressive thing, but for my shameless plug, speaking of art, if you, <laughs> if you liked, uh, watching us tonight, watching us, watching Colby, I was here, but if you enjoyed the show and you went, Oh my gosh, that all sounds great. I love that philosophy. I would like to do watercolors. I love rivers. I love water. I love a challenge. I like things that are easy. May I suggest picking up this book? And you can grab a copy right here at Town Book Center. And I'm, I don't know really get to say that while I'm here in the store, but today I do. So we are located uh, right across the street from the largest wagons in the country. It's right over there. Um, we're also next to Old Navy. But if you are not local to the Pennsylvania area, because we are in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, or if you prefer to do your shopping online, you're just not comfortable being out in public yet, you can always order with us at townbc.com. That's T-O-W, N is in Nike, E is in Echo, B is in Bravo, C is in Charlie.com. Um, and we'll send it to you, we'll ship it to you, we'll do curbside, whatever you want. Before I forget, also, if you went, gee, that's great, I already have this book, I already have Colby's other book, and I just, more Colby all the time, did you know that Colby has an Instagram account. Of course you did, because you were there in the beginning when I talked about it. And Colby, what's that Instagram account one more time so everyone can remember and check you out and harass, not harass, follow you. That's the right word on Instagram. Yeah, my Instagram account is at this writing desk. W-R-I-T-I-N-G desk, yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, and with that being done, Colby, thanks for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun doing this again with you. And yeah. I, I can't wait. I guess my final question, I know I shouldn't do a question after I do the wrap up, but um, is there anything else maybe that we're working on that we can talk about? There is uh, the potential idea of putting together some kind of uh, watercolor workbook that has actual watercolor paper. It. So there is, it's there's, it's a seedling. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? But it is definitely something I'm thinking about to kind of be a companion to my two books. So, Very cool. yeah, I dig that. I dig it a lot. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being here tonight. It was a lot of fun, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Bye, everyone. <laughs>